I never believed in this sort of thing until I saw it with my own eyes. As a park ranger, I've seen my fair share of strange happenings in the forest. Illegal hunting, vandals damaging the perimeter, and even a few missing persons. But nothing could have prepared me for what my trail camera captured last week. It started as routine surveillance, a camera set up to catch rule breakers. But what the camera caught wasn't human. I don't know how to explain it. But I've seen enough to know this wasn't a trick of the light. You need to see it for yourself. It all began just under a month ago. As rangers, we're used to handling peculiar situations, people who don't understand how to camp, preserve nature, or hike responsibly. But beyond that, you must understand, this is a vast park where many species coexist, and we witness nature running its course. Finding dead animals is common, but it's our job to investigate why they died, especially with poachers known to operate in the area. Around this time, we were on high alert because a group of poachers had been targeting elk and deer for their hides. These weren't amateurs. They used traps to avoid leaving traces and never fired shots that could give them away. When two dead deer were found near the lake, our suspicions grew. Down at Cleetwood Cove, by the dock, we found them, stripped of their hides, but with no signs of violence. It didn't make sense. Any predator would have left evidence of a struggle or bite marks. The deer were just lying on the rocks, likely killed in the early morning. By the time we found them, flies were teeming, laying their eggs in the corpse. The awful sight of it under the midday sun had attracted tourists, who were the ones to report it. We took photos and scanned the area for nearby camps. We knew it wouldn't be easy, it never was, but it was protocol and we had to follow it. A couple of days later, it happened again in the same area. This time, it was a dead elk, its antlers cut off. The elk showed subtle signs of violence. A knife had been used to slit its throat. Blood pooled around the body as if it had been completely drained. A colleague found it and immediately recognized the work of hunters. The method was too precise for it to be anything else. That's why we had to act. As rangers, we maintain a database of criminal groups. So we just needed a small detail to identify these killers and go after them. We decided to set up wireless trail cameras to give us eyes on the area, including infrared cameras that could detect movement, even at night. The incidents always happened when the park was quieter, with fewer tourists and visitors. We also had to be discreet when installing the equipment any sign of suspicion, and the hunters would move elsewhere in the vast park. But our plan worked. Three days after setting up the equipment, our cameras caught something. On September 13th, we got our first footage. A brief video showed three individuals posing as rangers, wearing the same uniforms, beige pants, matching shirts and jackets with staff printed on the back. It was a complete disguise. To an outsider, they looked like legitimate park staff, but to us it was clear they were imposters. They even carried radios. These weren't ordinary hunters. In the footage, we saw them standing in a circle, talking. One of them suddenly turned, something in the distance grabbing his attention. Another raised his hand, pointing at something outside the camera's range. Slowly, they started moving, heading toward a thick patch of bushes, likely spotting a deer or elk. But as one of them approached the bush, something from inside pulled him in. It was unreal, impossible. An unseen force, stronger than anything imaginable, yanked him out of view in two seconds flat. He was just... gone. The other two backed away in shock, pulling out their weapons and firing into the bush until their clips were empty. 
Then they froze, waiting for something more to happen, but nothing did. After a long pause, one of them cautiously approached the bush, crouched down, and seemed to grab something before sprinting away. The other followed and they vanished from the camera's view. When the video ended, the three of us, Rangers Luke Mooney, Millard Hebert, and I, exchanged glances, searching for answers. We radioed the rest of the team, telling them we were heading to the area to investigate, though we kept the details vague. It was clear something serious had happened, but we knew we had to be cautious. Without wanting to create panic, we made sure no one was nearby and armed ourselves with rifles designed for large, aggressive animals. But deep down, we knew whatever happened to that hunter wasn't the work of a bear. I must admit, despite my Native American heritage, I've never put much stock in mythical creatures. But at that moment, I had a feeling I was about to start believing. When we arrived at the site marked by the cameras, everything seemed normal. Nothing stood out but our instincts drove us to follow the exact path we'd seen on the footage. Mooney, Hebert, and I mimicked every movement. As I stood there, I touched the flash drive in my pocket, a reminder that I had the footage stored away. We had all agreed not to share the video with anyone else until we had solid evidence. For now, the other rangers just thought we were running Protocol Greenland, a routine inspection for a potential fire outbreak or chemical spill. While following the boot prints of the hunters, we also found spent bullet casings the shots they had fired were blanks. In other words, they had no chance of killing whatever it was that attacked them. Slowly, we approached the bush where the tragedy had occurred. We circled it, searching for any sign of life, but whatever had been hiding there was long gone. Then, something caught Ranger Hebert's eye, a glint at the base of the bush. Without hesitation, he moved toward it, Mooney tried to grab him, but it was too late. Hebert reached in and pulled out an arm, the severed arm of the hunter. What had been shining was a ring on the man's finger. Hebert dropped it immediately and stumbled backward, but the arm lay there, torn clean from its socket. A chill shot down my spine. I had the distinct, unsettling feeling that we were no longer alone in the woods. Something was watching us. We stood there, speechless. The horror of the scene was written all over our faces. There was no way we could keep this secret any longer. The area became a crime scene that day. Police arrived, and for the next 48 hours, that section of the park remained closed while they combed the site for clues. Experts analyzed the footage from every angle, exploring every possible explanation for the dismemberment. But the question that haunted everyone was, where was the rest of the body? There were no other significant clues, just that one video, which we must have watched a thousand times. And the more I watched it, the more convinced I became that whatever caused this wasn't human but there was still a lot of optimistic talk that it had been a bear attack. Honestly, after so many years as a ranger, I knew better. I even discussed it privately with Mooney and Hebert. Mooney was more skeptical, leaning toward the idea of a wild animal, while Hebert kept an open mind. He had seen the arm up close, felt the cold, lifeless skin, he knew something far more powerful than a bear had caused the dismemberment. Yet, there were no more clues, and no one was willing to suggest anything paranormal or out of the ordinary. As days passed, more details emerged, including the identity of the victim. Fingerprints confirmed that he was indeed a poacher. Eventually, they connected him to other hunters, but that didn't solve anything. In fact, by then, 
The poaching seemed like a side note to me. I couldn't stop thinking about the incident. It stayed with me, gnawing at my mind, until something even more shocking happened. On September 21st at 11 a.m., after a routine patrol with Hebert, we returned to the ranger station. I mentioned that the park felt eerily empty for a Saturday. Hebert, while making coffee, said he wasn't surprised given the season and recent events. As I sat down at the desk, a notification on the laptop caught my eye. I realized the security cameras from the investigation had never been taken down. Out of curiosity, I clicked on the footage. The video was from just 10 minutes earlier. I reviewed it, expecting nothing. At first, all I saw was a turkey vulture perched right in the center of the frame. I figured that's what triggered the camera. But just as I was about to close the video, I noticed something else. A massive silhouette moving in the background between the trees. Without taking my eyes off the screen, I called Hebert over but he took his time and by the time he got there, the silhouette had already disappeared. I told him we needed to get to that area immediately. Hebert, still holding his cup of coffee, looked confused, but I insisted there was no time to waste. On the way, Hebert kept telling me to calm down, saying I was acting crazy. I told him he had to see what I saw. When we arrived, we found an abandoned camp. I figured that must have drawn the attention of the animal, or beast. I didn't know what to call it. I asked Hebert to stay at the camp while I circled around to check. Whatever I had seen couldn't be far. He agreed to stay in case anyone showed up. I walked for about ten minutes, eventually stopping to take in the view of the mountains near the lake. No matter how long I have worked here, I never stopped loving the landscape. Suddenly. Hebert's panicked voice came over the radio. Hatcher, Hatcher! I immediately heard rifle shots in the distance. I didn't hesitate. I ran as fast as I could back toward the camp. As I neared it, I could see the tents in the distance. But then something stopped me in my tracks. It was one of the most unreal things I'd ever seen. Hebert was floating more than six feet off the ground. Something was holding him up, but the trees blocked my view of what it was. I could hear his desperate screams. Help! Help! In my panic, I could only shout, Hey, stop! Before I could run any further, Hebert dropped to the ground, lifeless. Whatever had attacked him fled. I sprinted to Hebert's side, but it was too late. He was motionless in the middle of the camp. His screams for help had been his last. He was dead. Overcome with shock and rage, I ran after whatever had done this. A stench filled the air along its path, not the smell of garbage or rot, but something distinct and powerful. As I followed the trail, I saw massive footprints in the dirt, huge prints that led deeper into the woods. The closer I got, the more certain I grew that I had been right all along. But now, I wasn't sure how I'd face the creature. I knew I would get my chance, though. Throughout the park, I had grown familiar with every rise and fall, and I was certain I was chasing it toward a tall mountain rise and a stark drop off a cliff. Then finally, I saw it. a massive figure, nearly 10 feet tall with its back to me. Its entire body was covered in hair like a giant ape. Without hesitation, it leaped into the void. I ran to the edge of the mountain, but it had already vanished. I rushed back to Hebert, but my suspicions were confirmed he had died the moment he fell. Staring at his lifeless body, Frustration welled up inside me. No one would believe me without proof. Then I looked to the side and saw one of the trail cameras in the tree. I remembered. I had evidence. 
I ran back to the ranger station, where I found Mooney with another ranger I didn't recognize. Trying not to raise suspicion, I greeted them casually and went to my desk. I don't think they noticed anything off, or maybe they just ignored it. After all, I didn't have the best reputation among the rangers. I downloaded the footage, carefully reviewing the moment of Hebert's attack, and there it was, clear as day. A beast nearly ten foot tall, with immense strength. It wasn't a werewolf. There was no doubt in my mind. I was looking at Bigfoot. Chills ran down my spine as I stared at the video. The world needed to see this. I pulled out the flash drive, saved the screenshots, the videos, everything. Then I closed my laptop, about to stand, when I felt a hand on my shoulder. I had been so focused on saving the evidence. I didn't notice Mooney and the other ranger standing behind me. I turned slowly, trying not to show my panic. Mooney said, I don't think now is the best time for you to leave. I was confused, but then the ranger I didn't know reached into his jacket and pulled out a government ID. You know, Hatcher, there are things the world isn't ready to know. The officer extended his hand and I knew what he wanted. I handed over the flash drive. He took my laptop and smashed it on the desk right in front of me. Then he looked me in the eye and said, The price of life is your silence. They both turned and left the cabin, leaving me sitting there, empty-handed. <laughs>